Thomas Udem, and I'm, I'll be the chair of the session on uh, atomical clocks. And uh, we have three speakers in this session. Uh, two of them will be on optical lattice clocks, and there will be one on searching for new physics uh, with these clocks. Um, the first one in the session is given by Jun Ye from, from Jilla, and uh, his contribution will be optical lattice clocks and quantum many body physics. Please, Jun. Well, thank you very much. And uh, certainly it's a great honor to come here to, to give you an update on the development of atomic clock. I remember giving that talk in beautiful Paris and I uh, followed it two, four years ago and we are now in beautiful Seoul. I've never been to South Korea before. It's a great opportunity to come to visit this beautiful country. The, this talk is about building optical atomic clock using many thousands of neutral atoms. And as towards the later part of my talk, I will show you some of the latest work where we're using quantum degenerate Fermi gas of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of atoms building the next generation atomic clocks that can go to 10 to minus 19, 10 to minus 20 uh, accuracy. Certainly that's our goal. And during this process of building these atoms, as an artistic rendition of many, many little atoms that's all carrying their own little clocks, they certainly can interact with each other. And I feel this is one of the major scientific challenge and also opportunities where atom-atom interaction, we are being very greedy. We are talking about giving, essentially getting eventually one million atoms all jammed into this optical lattice. And I want them to tell us the most accurate, most precise timetailing device to build that. And so we have to be careful how these atoms are interacting with each other that could potentially cause systematic uncertainties. As a clock builder, you want to make sure that is taken care of. On the other hand, it's a great opportunity also to use this clock as a platform to study quantum many body physics because it's already built in. It's something that you cannot avoid. And it's actually a rather intrigue um, quantum system to study how the microscopic atomic interactions gives rise to very interesting correlated quantum phenomena. And we'll show you a couple examples during my talk today. So it, it suffice to say clocks is an important device because it's everywhere. It can go from mundane industrial measurement process where any physical quantities can be translated into frequency that allow you to make better measurements, go to national security, national communication, uh, defense, homeland security, and the space explorations, advanced communication between satellites, um, advanced communication on the ground, and I think it, and also as a monitoring device for our environment in the universe. I think what excites me the most, of course, is its application to fundamental science, and to continue to have a very strong connection between the development of atomic clock and fundamental science. And here is showing an example that recently, for example, we've been thinking about how to put clocks in space and use that to directly detect gravitational waves as example. But other ex examples of advanced light sources, interconnected phase locked uh, deep space uh, telescopes and so on, they are all related in some way or another to the technology and the science of developing a really advanced atomic clock. So because we are talking about an optical atomic clock, and I also want, want to broaden the scientific context a little bit, Developing a clock is more than just developing a clock. It's also about controlling the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And here spans many decades of electromagnetic spectrum. The visible is a small part of it. For our clock, for the strontium atom, for example, the, the light happens to be at a 700 nanometer. And we use a laser, looks like a diode laser that you use to listen to CDs and uh, watch DVDs. If you zoom in about a factor of a million from the entire visible spectrum, you get to the line width of a diode on the order of a few hundred megahertz to a gigahertz or so. And that line width is way too broad to be used to, ex to explore the modern um, high resolution laser spectroscopy, let, let alone advanced optical atomic clocks. So we're relying on some pioneering develop development led by people such as Jan Hall and among many others. Um, to, to in the 1980s, for example, they developed the state-of-the-art optical interferometer formed by very low, ultra-low expansion optical glasses where the two mirrors is attached to it. 
And it, this allowed you to stabilize lasers back in 1980s, or like Christoph Saloma or Rainer Blatt, or these people are now look like elderly statesmen for uh, AMO science. They were at their younger ages as uh, postdocs working with Jan and so on, developed those technologies and allow you to have lasers to be stabilized down to a kilohertz. Uh, that's a fact of a million zoomed in from the Bayer diode. But you can, of course, towards the late 1990s, Jim Berquist, another one of the family members from the Hall family, was able to show they can actually get lasers down to a hertz level. But that's not sufficient. In fact, some of the, the best atoms, in fact, Jane Hall and, and many others have already thinking about, been thinking about using alkaline earth atoms back in 1970s. Calcium, magnesium, strontium, they were all considered back in the 80s and the 90s. And the experiment in Jela started on strontium started in the 1990s. And these atoms have uh, very special properties, as you can hear later on from my talk, as well as from Hidetoshi's talk, has a transition line was on the order of a millihertz. So that's why it takes really a strong effort, very motivated effort, to develop a system, a cavity, the modern looking cavity where it's made out of a crystalline material, to develop a cavity that has now has optical line was on the order of just a few millihertz and being able to explore very long quantum coherence that's afforded by the atoms confined in the optical lattices. And it comes back to the zoom out to the entire scientific landscape of electromagnetic spectrum. You will have a laser that has a, essentially a line width of a millihertz guided by these atoms, and using the new technology of so-called optical frequency, frequency comb, that you act as an optical ruler or act as a gearbox to transfer electromagnetic phase information from radio frequency to the light, you can use this one millihertz optical atomic transition to control the phase coherently the entire visible spectrum. And in fact, the revolution is going on that we can now control even the light in the extreme ultraviolet and in the future, soft X-rays. In this end, mid-infrared can use to do molecular spectroscopy. So this, this is a broader scientific context of developing atomic clock is also being able to use this as a modern tool to control light to, for many applications of laser spectroscopy. So what is the limit to optical coherence that, that we, we deal with every day in the lab? We use, we've built a fabric pro cavity formed by two mirrors and the standing waves in between the, these two mirrors. Just for ease of talking, let, let, let me say that the cavity distance between the two mirrors is about a meter. And we want to control a laser coherence, fractional laser frequency stability on the order of 10 to minus 16. And in fact, in, the, in some of the slides I will show you later, in the future we aim for 10 to minus 16 meters, 10 to minus 18 meters. Just consider the size of the a nucleus is 10 to minus 14 meters. So this is an incredible level of precision to maintain the dis relative distance stability between the two, the surface of the two mirrors. And of course, the, the reason we can achieve this is because the mold size of the optical beam hitting on these mirrors is, is average over typically across tens of a micron dis um, size. These mechanical structures can be described by so-called complex Young's modulus. It has both elastic portion and inelastic portion, whether it's a mirror substrate or whether it's the cavity structure supporting the mirrors or whether it's the coating on top of the mirror substrates. These are all mechanical structure and they all have dissipations. The dissipation leads to fluctuation by Einstein's, uh, Einstein's uh, dissipation fluctuation theorem. So each, each particular mechanical mode could contain energy of a Boltzmann constant times temperature as long as the temperature is not zero. Even if it's absolutely stable, you'll have fluctuations. And this fluctuation, adding up many of those mechanical modes together, gives rise to the so-called flicker flow of the fluctuation of the relative length scale that's described by this kind of a cartoon picture. And it typically scales as KT energy divided by how elastic the system is. The stronger the, uh, the elastic part of the Young's modulus, the better. And the, the better mechanical quality factor, the smaller the fluctuations. That's the typical fundamental limit for cavities like this. And one of the systems we have developed over the years for strontium systems, for example, the GLF 40 centimeter ultra low expansion cavity that achieved one times 10 to minus 16 fractional stability of something on the order of a 30 millihertz line was, is, is exactly described by this thermal noise fluctuation. That's a fundamental process unless you cool down the system. Or another idea is to use a different material. 
as, as I uh, stated earlier, you can use, for example, silicon crystal as a material because the silicon crystal offers very large Young's modulus, elastic apart, and the, the, more importantly, the mechanical quality factor is hundreds or thousands times higher than the glassy material that allow you to set much smaller thermal noise uh, limit on the fractional frequency stability. So in order to test out, for example, how good these cavities are made out of the silicon crystals, you can build two of them, just like you listen to the music instruments by beating the two sound. We can beat the two optical waveforms and here shows some of the very best line widths that we can measure out of these cavities. And these are two independent systems. You bring them together. Each one of them is contributing on the order of a nine millihertz line width. With optical coherence, now we can actually measure over on spectrum analyzer. You can watch for several minutes. The optical phase is maintaining within one radian fluctuations. And that gives you a stability of four times 10 to minus 17. And I want to thank my colleagues at PTB, Fritz Rehler, Uwe Stu for these almost decade-long collaboration that we started in 2007. And so this is getting close to the natural line width of strontium atom, which has actually 160-second coherence time. And this is exactly what I want to describe to you. I made a cheesy animation to describe coherence superposition between a ground excited state of the, of the electron in strontium atoms, and it oscillates in time. This oscillation has an extremely good quality factor of 10 to 17. And the reason we want to make a laser so good is I want to make sure that my laser can be exactly face connected to this atomic oscillation. Otherwise, we won't be able to read out this atomic information easily to, pick, to build a clock. But on the other hand, now the laser is reasonably good. It's also not easy to think that, yes, you have atom that has a very high, very high quality factors of a coherent superposition of those quantum states. How do you read that out in the lab is a challenge. And that really characterizes the entire field of AMO development over many years is to do precision spectroscopy, being able to read out such coherent superposition without perturbations, without technical noise arising from laboratory frame. And one of the ideas that we have is holding these atoms in a trap of light. And actually, Harold has already talked a little bit about this. And so if by holding these atoms in the trap like this, we can actually, if they are cooled by laser, you, you can get those atoms down to nano of temperature and hold them there for a long, long period of time. Some of the, our strontium atoms now can live in our vacuum chamber for a couple minutes. And that's as, as long as the quantum coherence can last. So then you can use lasers to probe the internal state to build a clock. But a key concept here is that you want these atomic states that's supporting the clock transition, the coherent superposition that I was describing the, the, the previous slide, an oscillating dipole between the single S0 triple P0 state, that, which has a very long lifetime, 150 second quantum coherence. We want to make sure the atom is confined in a very well specially designed trap where the ground state and the excited state both have the same trapping potential by the light field, such that the coherent superposition between the ground and excited state is not perturbed due to the presence of these trap that's holding the atoms there for you to look at a long time. And, and it, even more so, we typically, in our first generation of clocks, actually, in fact, the, I, would, I would say majority of by far the most, almost all of the clocks that's operating in the world on the strontium lattice clock or utopian lattice clock is one dimensional lattice where you form a two-dimensional pancake trap. So we typically have, in gel experiments, we typically have 20 or so atoms per pancake, and you have hundreds of those pancakes working together. You can think of this as many, many of those pendulums working in parallel, and, and that's where we gain the sensitivity because we can have thousands of atoms providing the precision spectroscopy information that can, we can improve that by square root of the number n. Because of this confinement of these atoms in a motionless optical lattice, we can essentially completely remove the Doppler and the recoil effect due to the, due to the single photon transition. You are, you are driving the atom from the ground to the excited state. The, its motional states of these atoms are quantized in, the, in these optical lattices such that you can keep the motional states to be exactly unchanged when you're doing the investigation the, of the internal state. Uh, quantum coherence. And this is a typical line shape we can gain from the lab. It looks very classic textbook line shape on the order of a Hertz also line with a typical class, uh, uh, very classical Rabi line shape that we 
look at these atomic transitions and we use this to build the clocks. But the key question is the atomic interaction effects. And so use those type of system, we, can, we build two strong team systems back in 2011 and we compared those two of those back in 2012 and we were able to show the stability indeed is unprecedented at the time, three times 10 to minus 16 at one second and averages down, this is the relative frequency stability in fractional terms as a function of the average in time. As you can see, very, very nicely obey the white noise of a square root of the time averaging. But what's really important is that we can now claim at a 1,000 second time scale, this number goes to 10 to minus 17. And in fact, this is all because of the possibility of improving the laser coherence we were making those advancing. And the recent results, we can now put this number by another factor of two or three down. So just in a few hundred seconds, we can cross the 10 to minus 17 level of measurement precision. So any accuracy and systematic uncertainties at this level can now be measured and controlled. I think this is the most important point. If the, if the precision is low and you have a 10 to minus 18 systematic effects, it takes just too long to average this out and those systematic effects may be fluctuating and, and that brings it very hard, very challenging to, to control. But the fact that we can have a such good precision now, even at 10, reaching 10 to minus 17, even reaching 10 to minus 18 in less than one hour, allows you to characterize any known systematic effects as well as think about unknowns and measure them, bring them under control. Some of the historical best, uh, for example, Dave Wine's single trapped aluminum ion clock stability is about a factor of five or so worse and a cesium clock that, that defines the fundamental, the, the primary time standards is about a factor of 100 worse in the measurement precision. And with these Good measurement precision, of course, the key question of building standards like optical clock, you have to measure many, many different certain uncertainties. The key was to be able to claim that we make a frequency measurement of a bare universal atom that regardless the location of the atom, whether it's in, in Europe, in, in Japan, in China, uh, in Korea, in the US, they should all tell the same, same time as long as we know the gravitational potential. So we want to measure many of those systematic effects systematic perturbations, and I, I just name a few of those really quick. These atoms are confined in optical lattice traps. They have a lattice stock shifts that we have to characterize. They have interaction effects we have to characterize. You have any residual electrical field, magnetic field can cause problems. The, the temperature uh, in the laboratory can give rise to black body radiation that can give rise to frequency shift on these atoms. You have to characterize those. So we underwent a few years of very uh, careful systematic evaluations of, the, of these uncertainty effects, including the black body radiation uh, in both the static and dynamic terms, density effect, the collisional effect, stock shifts. And another year later, we, we improved many of those measurements, cultivating into uh, essentially making very precise measurements of the AC stock effect at 10 to minus 18 level. And I'll come back to this point at the very end of my talk because this was the key understanding that allow us now to build a three-dimensional quantum degenerate optical atomic clock by controlling those AC stock effects extremely well. And as well as the, to absolute BBR thermometry of in situ measuring the BBR environment of these atoms by using NIST calibrated BBR sensors that's in the vacuum. So all of these uncertainties can be characterized with an overall number on the order of two times 10 to minus 18. This represents some historical trend of the advancing the uncertainty of atomic clocks after World War II, the, the cesium fountain clocks, cesium beam clock, cesium fountain clock, all the way down to one times 10 to minus 16 level. The optical standards came around uh, really in the 1980s and 90s, as I mentioned earlier, for, by many of the pioneers, some of them sitting in this audience. But the frequency comb development in the late 90s and early 2000s marked the, the finally the chapter where the optical clocks can be launched in the laboratory that can be transferred directly to the microwave frequency. And the development of the optical clock has really sped up. And over the, I'm only showing some of the strontium results over the past decade or so, and you can see the advance has been very rapid. And this number represents two times 10 minus 18. I also want to mention that Ion clock continues to make advances as well. This is a group 
of Eka Pike's group in PTB, for example, recently announced, and their iron clock uncertainty have reached the three times 10 to my 18 level. And, and of course, I want to continue to emphasize the point of this, the, the neutral atom systems, the fact that we can use tens of thousands of atoms, and later on in the future, perhaps millions of those atoms, that we, we remain to be optimistic that these numbers will, will come down still relatively fast over the next decade or so. So this is where I want to sort of take a break and switch to the next, uh, the second half of my talk. And really, I, I think of these many atoms as a new opportunities and new challenges. As we know, controlling single particle and its quantum state perfecting the control, allowed uh, people like Dave Weinland, Serge Halosh to advance this incredible single particle based quantum information processing, uh, as well as the clock uh, advanced precision biology to the level of 10 to minus 17 or so. The difference here is we, we want to harness the coherence of many tens of thousands of atoms at once, so that it runs many of those parallel pendulums and together. At 10 to minus 18 level, you can't really just say atoms don't interact, because they do. And in, in fact, at 10 to minus 16 level, we measure the atomic interactions. And this has been a major uh, challenge for us over the last eight years, is to be able to say those effects are there, that we can characterize it, and we can push them down. And, and it, but it's also during the process of doing so, allowed us to learn a lot about an atomic many body system. So at 10 to minus 18 level, these effects a bit, must be understood to advance our goals, even if you're just interested in clocks, because otherwise your pendulum may be swinging at different rates. It also is really interesting because once you understand these interactions, you can advance the next generation of clocks where the quantum correlation, the correlations of the spin noise of these atoms can be, can be made to advance further, so-called spin squeezing, where the measurement precision is no longer limited by the square root of how many atoms you use, but rather by the number of particles you have in the system. And I think this is where precision metrology, quantum many body physics, and the quantum metrology all coming together, and it's a very exciting frontier. So let me start with a mundane talk of clock shift. And in fact, Harold Haas's talk earlier today reminded me that you know, the early days when, um, I remember I was a graduate student working with Jan Hall in 1996, 97 at that time, and hearing about the rumors of BECs about to be made in hydrogen. But before they made the BEC, there was, and I remember Tom Killian, because he, he and I basically are the same age. We, were, we went into graduate school about the same time. He came to visit Jella and told me about the two photon hydrogen measurements that where the, the density shift is, is a key. And of course, Thomas Udom and Ted Hensch has been doing that for, for many, many years and knows about the density shifts. And we, we always say, well, that means you don't, do not want to put a too dense atomic sample together because that's going to have a density shift. And this also motivated early on the concept of when we want to build a clock, and Wolfgang Kadley actually made that point uh, I think in 2001 or something, you, you have to use ultra-cold fermions where, the, uh, where these fermions can come together at least when you write down the symmetrization of the wave function. It has to be anti-symmetrized so that these atoms won't have the, when the temperature is low enough, won't have a collisional process. The so-called S wave will be blocked by the, uh, the quantum symmetrization requirement. And the P wave has centrifugal barrier. So when we made those measurements 10 to minus 15 level in back in 2007, we did not see any frequency shift. However, when we advanced the measurement precision by a factor of 10 or so uh, in two years, we actually saw a clear indication of the frequency shift. At the time, there was discussion of whether these atoms are actually identical or not due to the excitation being inhomogeneous. There could be S-wave component, and there, no doubt there, would, there is S-wave component in there that we can measure. But there's also P-wave, which can be acting a collective way if your excitation is actually homogeneous, and I will explain that later. But over the years now, finally we were able to understand these frequency shift mechanisms and controlling them to, to be less than 10 to minus 18 level, and, and in, the, in the end of my talk, I will conclude by telling you where we can go to the 10 to, uh, below the 10 to minus 19 level. I want to th acknowledge the incredible intellectual contributions of Anna Maria Ray in helping us understanding these collisional problems in the quantum regime. And it, just by briefly saying, the strontium atoms, like any alkaline earth atoms, 
you can use three degrees of freedom to, to very elegantly describe this collisional process. One degree of freedom is electronic from the ground, electronic and excited state. Those are two states you're measuring clock transitions. Strontium has 10 nuclear spins, so there's, 10, so there's a nuclear spin degrees of freedom. You, ha, you can use a magnetic field, you have a 10, uh, 10 Z-man state. I dot J equals to zero, but actually it's not completely true. At the level of a millihertz level, there is actually splittings due to the fact that triple P0 has different hyperfine mixing than the single S0, and that which made the clock transition to be possible. So it's, it's mostly I dot J equal to zero at the level of precision of beyond 10 millihertz. But if you go below 10 millihertz, of course, that the SUN symmetry will be broken. And finally, you also have to use quantum mechanical uh, degrees of freedom to describe the motion, motional states of the atom. These atoms are confining harmonic traps of your optical potential, and they occupy a particular quantum state. And so if you want to anti-symmetrize the wave function between these two particles, you have to consider all these three degrees of freedom. And in some ways, you can say, if I put all the atoms into a single nuclear spin polarized state, uh, or you, you put a nuclear spin symmetri symmetrized state, then you can, when you describe the atoms, when they come together with coherent superposition of the electronic degrees of freedom, you have to describe them as a P wave if the coherent superposition is symmetrized in so-called a triplet state, if you consider this as a pseudo spin half system. And they come together, have to be in so-called a spatially anti-symmetrized P wave, and that's what describes the interaction. If, on the other hand, you can arrange these atoms to have a nuclear spin to be anti-symmetrized, then even if those atoms are spin symmetrized in the electronic degrees of freedom, they can come together and interact in the S wave. So even though the nuclear spin does not couple to electronic degrees of freedom, and it does not contribute to energy, energy scales of the clock measurements, it, play, it could play a very important role in setting the symmetrization requirement and essentially turning on turning on or turning off electronic interactions by just flipping the nuclear spins at a way that you control it. And this really describes, this framework describes many of the work that I will describe later on. Uh, in this particular case, now let's have those atoms be spin polarized. So this nuclear spin is just a single degree, uh, it's all, all controlled, so you can just think of only the electronic degrees of freedom. The clock is nothing but very precisely processing these electronic pseudo spin half systems the interaction is rather weak due to the P wave on the order of a hertz or so. But if you wait a long time, uh, the interaction is one hertz, but if I have a laser, they have a coherence time of a minute. And so if you wait uh, 60 seconds with one hertz interaction energy, the system becomes completely correlated. And in fact, this becomes a strongly correlated system. This is what physics is always, it's nothing but energy scale adjustment. Um, so these quantum fluctuations fluctuations of individual spins become correlated, and you can measure this. For example, by doing Rabi spectroscopy, you can think of it's nothing but comparing the coherent precession of the Rabi rate of those spins with respect to the spin-spin interaction. If the spin-spin interaction dominates of the coherent evolution, you have a correlated complex, correlated spin spectrum, and when you make measurements, you will see excitation being blocked as you go to longer, longer coherence time or smaller, smaller Rabi frequency, you are probing this very complex spin spectrum in the excited state. An even cleaner measurement would be you prepare those spins in initial state and you put them into a coherent superposition between the ground and excited state, just like described in a block sphere, and this little fuzzy ball dictates the quantum noise of individual spin fluctuations, and it just wait. The Hamiltonian will take its toll if you wait for a while, the spin interactions will take place where all these spins become correlated, and you can make a measurement such that the quantum noise distribution of those spins become distorted due to the correlation. And, and the measurement of the Ramsey fringe will, will describe, for example, how this axis is twisting and, and so on. For clock experiment, one of the insight that we got from this is, in fact, the frequency shift of the final clock readout pulse depends on the first pulse, depends on orientation of the very first pulse, whether you put them in exactly in equatorial plane or tilting down a little bit or tilting up a little bit. There's a particular angle of the tilt of the coherent superposition of the electronic spin where the interaction is free, where there's no frequency shifts anymore. And so if you want, if you care about the clocks, you can just operate at this particular uh, coherent superposition angle and there won't be any frequency shift. 
and how well you can control the frequency shift depends on how precise, how accurate you can measure this particular coherence or position angle. Another really intriguing effect is the so-called SUN symmetry. There's a, as I described, there's a built-in symmetry of these different nuclear spins since they do not really contribute to the interactions of the electronic degrees of freedom. So one of the spectroscopy measurements we can make is applying coherent uh, or incoherent, rather, superposition of nuclear spins. In fact, the, for example, you can look at single particle spectroscopy. You can see all of the 10 nuclear spins are contributing. And these atoms can be th thought of as a spectator atoms when you are looking at, a, for example, clock transition between the two spin nine half state of the dictated by these two black balls. And these, the, these spectator atoms, because the fact of the hidden symmetry of those nuclear spins, because they are, not, they are not really interacting with electronic degrees of freedom, they're just giving you the quantum uh, symmetrization requirement. And so if these are incoherent, you can actually change the distribution at a random at whatever the, uh, the distribution you would like. And what you will find out is as long as you're properly normalized to the number of atoms you have in those spectator atom positions, you will see all the frequency shift collapse into a single line. Again, the measurement, the SUN symmetry is good all the way till you can measure something on the order of a millihertz when finally the line width of the atomic transition itself is being of course, oriented is being dictated by the hyperfine transitions. And once you go beyond the, the precision set by the atomic, uh, atomic state, then you will, the SUN symmetry will be broken. But as long, as long as you're measuring at beyond one millihertz level of accuracy, you will see very strict uh, SUN symmetry being preserved. And you may ask, you know, how useful is that kind of uh, uh, nuclear spin uh, symmetrization or manipulation for quantum antibody physics? And here's one example. So here's the 10 nuclear spin states that are all there. And you can think of this pseudo spin half. You can, you can think of this uh, orbital degrees of free freedom. And there's a nuclear spin hidden flavor of 10 different nuclear spins. If these atoms are confined in an optical lattice, what they're dealing with is spin spin interactions mediated by the hidden SUN symmetry. If you let those spins actually tunnel in the atom, in, in, the, in the optical lattice, so we have now undertaken experiment of spin orbital coupling, whereby the very fact that the magical wavelengths confining these atoms in 1D lattice and actual laser itself probing these atomic transitions are not commensurate. If you let atoms start to tunnel, you can actually have effective flux coming out using this two degrees, pseudo two degrees of freedom of a G to the E state. And, and using the tunneling as a way to, for the atom to pick up the face because the atom being excited in this pancake will have different optical face than the atom being excited in this pancake because the two wavelengths are mismatched. So you can have this hidden uh, synthetic magnetic field can be coming out of this, this effective flux that you can, you can impose on by the optical field. And then you can open up those nuclear spins as if those are the actual spins moving as the charged particles in a synthetic magnetic field. And so this, this field is so exciting, we're actually converting one of our clock experiment now onto the spin orbital coupling with many body interactions. You know, remember these atoms interact with each other and can read out directly from clocks. So this represents a very exciting new direction. But going back to the main experiment, say we want to continue to advance the clock precision. Is it possible to control atomic interaction effect below 10 to minus 19 or below 10 to minus 20 to a, to a point such that we can really always, as long as I have measurement precision that allow me to measure the accuracy within 10, 20 minutes of 10 to minus 19, I can continue to make my lasers to be better, continue to put more atoms into the system, then I can really build better clocks and, and, and use that eventually to be, be a, a, one of the most effective device to measure some of the hidden symmetries, the gravitational waves and dark matters and so on. We will hear about that from Mariana Safranova's talk later. So I want to tell you a little bit in the next six minutes to tell you a little bit of the latest advance that we made in the lab. So the, the idea being that we want to build a quantum synthesized atomic lattice where the atoms are confined one per site and, and that's guaranteed by either Pauli's exclusion principle if all the atoms are only in the single nuclear spin state and they occupy the lowest possible band of these atoms, of these structures, because we call them so-called. 
And so that's either the energy gap or poly expression principle is guaranteeing that. This allows us to build a system with the largest number of atoms that we can, con we can pack together and it still guarantees that at least the contact interaction is not important. Maybe later on, Peter Zoller will tell us about, you know, these lattices can be further compacted in. The, the, the goal is being able to put more and more atoms in there and, and I can control how they interact and then I, I would be able to build better, better, more precision. I don't see any limit in terms of how, how well you can advance that frontier. So to, to attempt this, uh, we very quickly turned one of our machines into a quantum degenerate gas machine. It can produce two 200,000 strontium-87 atoms at 70 nanocalvin and quickly cool down to the Fermi temperature T of a TF of 0.2 or so. And we load them into the optical lattice and we can see they are loaded into the, the lowest band by the band mapping picture there, the plus minus, only the lowest band, plus or minus h by k, is being released when you, when you look at a free time of flight expansion, or more directly, you can use clock spectroscopy to look at the so-called sideband transition where you can only see the blue sideband information in the, the x, omega, x, omega, y, omega, z, because we are not dealing with three-dimensional lattice, but there's no so-called red sideband information coming out, indicating those atoms are well occupied in the ground state. And then we flip some of the different nuclear spin states, put them on top of this. Some of the, if the nuclear spin state is different from the original atoms that are confining the lattice, of course, then you no longer have a poly exclusion principle. So in principle, you can have two atoms occupying the same lowest ground band. And you can immediately see those interactions. These interactions used to be on the order of one hertz. And that was a particularly bad, if, if you're a clock builder, if the frequency shift, is a similar to the line shape of your spectroscopy. That's the worst case scenario because it's going to, going to distort the line shape. But if you can somehow quantize the interaction such that the interaction is now shifted more than one kilohertz away from atomic transition, which can be in principle hundreds of millihertz or, or one millihertz wide, these interactions suddenly plays no role, completely suppressed at the level of 10 to minus 20 that we calculated. So this is a very appealing for us in, in terms of wanting to build clock. But for many body physics, those are the sidebands. You can play a lot of games of spin exchange and so on. So these are both sides of the coin that you can play games on. And I want to come back to this uh, tensor and scalar light shift that I mentioned earlier. When we, we, when we made the lattice in the one dimensional space, we, early work has always been, oh, we, let's get close to the magical wavelengths and let's just change the intensity of the light and watch the frequency shift and extrapolate what is the final, uh, the, the correction for the frequency shift due to, due, due to the AC stock effect. But, but then we sort of, two years ago, we said, why don't we find a particular location where the, when you, as you move intensities, the frequency does not shift at all. And it turns out, in order to achieve this condition, we have, there's a vector shift, there's a tensor shift, there's a scalar shift. The vector shift can be pretty much uh, uh, get to zero uh, because you can measure plus or minus nine half state. You can, you can make sure the polarization of your light is exactly along the direction of the quantization axis. It's a linear polarization and so on. But there's always a vector shift. Uh, uh, sorry, there's always a tensor shift um, as well as a scalar shift. And you can actually combine those two shifts into one effective so-called magic wavelength where it, at that particular wavelength, no matter what intensity you use, at least in, in our measurement precision of 10 to minus 18 level, that we can actually see that the frequency shift, the correction is at one times 10 to minus 18. So with this, this brings our, uh, the new idea of being able to create a three-dimensional optical lattice clock. And I want to say this idea, in fact, this particular configuration is different, but there were earlier work in 2012 by a group in CIRT, Paris, that had proposed already that you can orient angles of the lattice beams with a particular directions with a quantization axis that, and it's possible to control the, the overall lattice shift in three dimensional lattice to be zero. This particular realization is actually very, very simple and it, it, it takes me like 30 seconds to explain to you. This is a three dimensional optical lattice. You can use X direction, Y direction, all have the same linear polarization with the quantization axis as well as the clock. For that particular direction of X, Y, it turns out the, the frequency AC stock effect depends on the offset from the scalar magical frequency. 
because of the tensor contribution. So you can, you can see, in fact, there's a slope here. And I can pick a frequency offset, the lattice frequency offset from the, the scalar part of the zero by about two, minus 200 megahertz or so. And suddenly, I can get a zero AC stock shift overall for the beam of X beam and Y beam. Now, the Z beam is actually special because Z beam, the polarization is necessarily being perpendicular to the quantization axis. And this used to be the thing that we are very scared about that we won't be able to control the polarization of the lattice and so on. But turns out, if you follow the upper branch of the Z polarization, it's the same trick, that there's a, this little slope that as long as you move to the positive 150 megahertz offset from the zero scalar position, you have an overall AC stack shift of zero. So now the solution is simply put X, Y beam at one frequency, Z beam at another frequency, and voila, you have a lattice which is very stable and has zero total AC stock effect. And how, how can I be so confident? It turns out this is the best atom-like coherence we have ever seen in the lab. And I would say, you know, this is really the best atomic coherence that people have seen in the lab anywhere. You can drive the system up and down for, for eight seconds, and the rabbit oscillation just keeps going. This is the line shift of 190 millihertz, the most recent data. We can split the line with a Ramsey fringe of 100 millihertz. And what I'm particularly very proud of is this Rabi line shape has excitation fraction almost 100%. Okay, it's 90% excitation. Used to be when we had interactions on, when we tried to get our lasers more coherent and drive the system, as we go to longer, longer interact, uh, coherence time to probe it, we are blocked by the interaction. So that even though the line width is trying to go narrower, but the excitation we block the only a fraction, one fifth, and so on. So there, therefore, the line was, was never able to be demonstrated to be this narrow. And now, it seems like that problem is being removed. I think my time is up. I uh, want to thank uh, many people who made the contributions over the work over many years. They are all moved on to their own independent career. Uh, the, at the moment, people in the lab, Sarah Bromley, uh, Toby Bothwell, picture is not shown. Uh, uh, Shimon Kokowitz, picture is not shown. And the, uh, the, the people who build strontium 3D lattice, in fact, are here. Uh, Sarah Campbell, Aki Goban, um, Nelson, uh, Ed, uh, Ed Mahdi, and uh, Ross Hudson. And also, Wei, Wei Zhen has been leading the effort of building this, in, uh, this incredible narrow line with lasers, along with a theoretical collaboration with Anna Maria Ray, and many collaborators around the world. And, and I want to also acknowledge uh, Andrew Daly, uh, in, at the time was Peter Zola's postdoc, really set us sort of on the quantum information side of things from clock in, back in 2008. And, and that has been a great path moving forward. Many, many collaborations with Michelle Luking. And finally, I, I think I'm done, but I just want to put this slide up here that the next systematic effect there's no more interactions, right? But actually there is. When you drive these atoms by a coherent superposition, these are radiating little dipoles, and that actually connects to Friday's talk of ultra-quarter atoms, that ultra-quarter molecules, sorry, there will be a session on ultra-quarter molecules, and the clock connects to that uh, in a way where you can use collective dipoles to study many things, whether it's super coherent, uh, super radiance, sub -radiance, collective dipole, line shifts, and so it's, Riedeberg physics. So it's very exciting. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, June, for this exciting talk. Um, the paper is open for questions. It's hard to see here. I think there's one in the back. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Jun years for your uh, fantastic talk. So may I ask you, uh, now you got a very narrow line winds for the laser, so around uh, 9 millihertz. So that's why the short stability is very good, so about uh, 4, 10 to minus 16. So now, but for long-term stability, you now got uh, uh, 5 times 10 to minus uh, 14. So could you expect how much the freak flow for the uh, long-term stability, and uh, also, uh, could you expect uh, how much the uh, the limitation for the long-term sta long stability? Um, 
the results I showed you uh, for the full three times 10 to minus 16 at one second was actually obtained with a laser that has 30 millihertz line width. We haven't applied the best laser yet to these latest results. Um, I expect uh, the quantum projection noise, if you get 10 to the four, 10 to the five atoms, and you can get to enjoy a coherence time on the order of, I'll say about a minute, 60 seconds. The entire coherence time of the atom is 160 seconds. That at one second, you will be able to reach a stability of below 10 to minus 17 at one second. So we are very far, and that's actually the reason why I'm being very optimistic, saying the progress of the field will still be fast, because we are so far. We, you know, we sort of only scratch the surface at, at a three times 10 to minus 16 is using a laser of 100 millihertz, 10 milli, uh, 20, 30 millihertz laser with 1,000 atoms. And we have not applied this to many thousands of atoms, many tens of thousands of atoms. But once the measurement precision is improved, say I get to one times 10 to minus 17 at one second, then a cup of coffee time, you will be done at 10, mid 10 to minus 19 level. That's when systematic effects like the one that I'm showing here, uh, that people build Rydberg physics, Rydberg atom systems to study, we can actually now bring them to the clock realm to study at you know, time scale of 10 minutes or so. And once you can study those problems in 10 minutes or so, you will be able to solve those problems, right? The, the problem is not solved. It usually is when the accurate, the, the average time goes beyond hour or two, or a, once you go beyond a day, certainly things don't work because people need to go home and uh, sleep and eat. Uh, and the next day come in the different set of systematics. So you better control them when you're in the lab. And that's typically on the time scale less than one hour. So the higher the, the precision you can advance, absolutely you can do a better accuracy. There's no question about it. It always goes hand in hand. Just simply because you can look better, right? Thank you. Any more questions? Maybe I can ask a question, Jun. So you explained how to balance the, the scalar and the tensor uh, shift yes. by, uh, by using the right polarization. Um, you know, with this magic wavelength, you know, you treat in the necessity of measuring an intensity by the necessity of measuring the frequency of the lattice laser. But here it seems like you, that you make another deal. You treat in as a necessity of measuring intensity by the necessity of measuring polarization. And that doesn't necessarily sound like a very good deal to me. So how well can you measure this polarization? That's an excellent question. Actually, this is, a, this is something we actually went back and forth quite a bit in the group. After the Paris group published the paper in 2012, there's a PIL paper by, I think, Pierre Lemong, it was still there at the time. They, what they propose is tilt these polarization to something like a 50, 60 degrees and so on. And it, and I never truly, even though I really love Pierre, I never truly liked that idea because the polarization is an is a analog quantity. It's very easy to make a mistake in the lab when your polarizer, you know, how do you set the degree of uh, the polarization to be exactly right? And you always have to measure. So, so we, what we decided is it's easier to say, I have two polarization which is orthogonal. Uh, and I'm just going to play games on move the frequency around until it crosses zero. So it's still the fundamental idea of magic wavelength where you're only moving frequency around until you find a location where intensity dependence goes to zero. But polarization is maintained as strictly as you can by 10 to minus four polarizers to be exactly horizontal or exactly vertical. But we don't play games in between. We don't rotate those polarization in between. And that seems like a fairly robust way. You know, just like in 1D optical lattice clock experiments, we set our polarization to be parallel with the magnetic field. But of course, that parallel is, can only be set to a certain precision you have in your quarter wave plate. Okay. Eventually, you have to measure it. And this is the same idea here. OK, I see. I think I get the, get the point. Are there any more questions? It's really hard to see. I don't see anybody, so if that's not the case, then let's thank June again. Thank you. The next uh, speaker in the session will be Hidetoshi Katori uh, from Riken and the University of Tokyo. And
he will tell us about his frequency ratio measurements between different lattice clocks at the 17th decimal place.